Greetings, fellow Homo sapiens, and welcome to the Symbiotic Podcast. I'm your host, Cole Hans, and today I'm very pleased to have uh, three guests on our show as we launch into our new series of COVID-19 research briefs. Uh, we've got Taylor Scott on the line today. Uh, Taylor is Associate Director of the Research to Policy Collaboration at Penn State within the Edna Bennett Pierce Prevention Research Center. And we also have special guests from the Democracy Works podcast, which is produced by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State. We've got the director of the McCourtney Institute, Michael Berkman, who is a professor of political science at Penn State. And we have the host of the Democracy Works podcast, Jenna Spinelli, on the line. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for being with us today. It's great to be here, Cole. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So I just want to kick off uh, with Taylor and give Taylor a chance to tell us about a seed-funded project uh, that the Huck Institutes, along with the Social Sciences Research Institute, um, got together and funded as part of a, a big, big uh, uh, effort at Penn State to fund coronavirus research. And this project is called the Rapid Translation of Research into Coronavirus Policy Response, which sounds like a really important topic right now. Taylor, could you just briefly tell us what this project is about? Sure. Well, the reason I'm really excited about the work that we do is because we lament as scientists the work that we produce takes so long to reach decision makers and make its way into actual uh, use of research evidence. Um, that's the area of uh, work that we're with, we're really focused on is how does research get used by decision makers and particularly by legislators. And so um, what we know from that is that um, it's not sufficient to just write up a report and allow it to sit on the dusty shelf, but using research evidence is a very interactive process. And so um, we've been doing this work for a few years now and really we're hoping to um, leverage this opportunity to be adaptive and responsive to decision makers' needs around coronavirus research. We want to have a, um, a bridge between the research that's getting produced and um, the people who need it the most to guide decision making. And so our grant, um, our, uh, the support from Penn State will help us to um, do some legislative needs assessments around their interests related to coronavirus research and particularly how it intersects with issues related to children and families, the social side of the pandemic. Um, we know, for instance, um, concerns about violence and maltreatment on the rise and going undetected because kids aren't in schools, um, victims of violence not being able to flee into shelters. How do we respond to those issues with the, um, the, the experience uh, experiences and knowledge and skill sets that researchers have accumulated across their careers. How, what, how can that be um, supporting decision makers as they grapple with how to address those tricky issues? And so we'll do a legislative needs assessment, working with um, legislative partners to identify their policy goals and then identify ways that researchers with corresponding expertise or interest areas can be mobilized to respond to those issues. And with the, the goal in this case to be doing digital interactions with congressional partners um, about the research and ways that researchers can get involved in supporting those interest areas. Thank you very much for describing that. So in a sense, you're almost acting like a, a matchmaker between um, politicians trying to make policy and researchers that have the good data to help them make that policy. Do I get that right? That's right. I like that description. Right on. Well, it's certainly a very hot topic to talk about research and policy. Uh, I should I should mention that we're having this conversation on uh, May sixth. Uh, this is a day when um, the Trump administration is talking about disbanding their coronavirus um, task force. Potentially, uh, we've had people, you know, at state capitals in in recent weeks uh, with you know automatic weapons uh, protesting. Um, we've got a guy making pipe bombs. Um, we've got here in Pennsylvania, um, Center County is about to go into the yellow zone. Other counties are not. At every level, it seems, um, this, this whole topic of, of research around coronavirus and policymaking couldn't be more contentious and just um, in our face, right? So with that, I, I want to turn things over to uh, Michael and Jenna to, to talk about the political side of, of this whole topic of 
of research and policy making uh, that is that is so um, so hot right now and, and in our faces. Yeah. So you know, Cole, you you touched on um, several topics that we've covered on Democracy Works recently, from the protesters to uh, issues of, of federalism. You know, the kind of state by state response that we've seen in, in deciding to shut down during the early part of the pandemic and to reopen uh, now as we enter into to May and moving on into the summer. That's something pretty unique to to America's system of of government, but. Um, you know, hearkening back to, to you know some of what what Taylor was saying in this this notion of of expertise, um, something that we talk about also a lot on Democracy Works is why um, expertise is important in in a democracy. And um, for listeners, uh, Michael, that might not have heard all of those rants uh, on Democracy Works, would you mind um, telling us a little bit about uh, the role that expertise plays in a democracy? Well, well, no rant, but uh, but this is a, a really uh, important topic, and uh, Taylor, what a what an interesting initiative that you're you're involved with now. Uh, you know, I I think one way of thinking about this is that there is always a tension between democracy and expertise in American politics, or maybe a, maybe a better way of thinking about it is that there's a tension between populism and expertise in American politics. Uh, where experts are often seen as the sort of elites that populists uh, arise against, that populists think that they, uh, populist movements tend to think that they know the truth, that they know what's right, that they know what they need, and that elites are pointy-headed intellectuals, uh, to borrow from uh, George Wallace's terms. And so there's constantly been this sort of tension uh, within American politics. I think we're seeing it a lot of it with the COVID. Uh, we're seeing it in the sort of protests, obviously, that you're talking about, which I think are really uh, important distillations of this. And I think the disbanding of the task force today, or at least the announcement that the task force will be winding down, uh, is quite important because I think it signals that the Trump administration is uh, turning its attention from the uh, scientific from the uh, from the science and the battle against the coronavirus to reopening the government and a reliance on uh, business leaders and economists to figure out how to do that. That's right, and and I've I've been thinking about that as well. So in a sense, um, it comes down to values, is is what I see here. Is as a culture, as a nation, or any nation, or or any subdivision you want to pick, um, what are the values that that hold the most? Uh, power or how, how are those values stacked? And, and one way um, our director was uh, talking about it to me this week uh, after talking to some local officials right here in Center County was um, people feel like they have to face a choice between their life and their livelihood. And that's a horrible choice. Um, when I see that, I, I wonder if there are more creative ways that we can honor both life and livelihood. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of times those those other ways, the more creative ways can just get drowned out in the static of my life, my livelihood and the battle. You know, is there another way that that isn't such a battle? And it's really hard to find a way like that when when the stakes are so high, when it is when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of deaths potentially and and um, looks like we're headed to those numbers uh, and millions of people out of work. Right. Yeah. You know, you know, I think when you look around the states, you look at the national government and the different ways that this has been dealt with, I think you see some very different approaches. And, it, and there are some where I think political leaders have done a very good job of trying to communicate what they're learning from their experts, from their scientists, uh, from their public health professionals, and are able to do this in a nonpartisan sort of way where they're not trying to turn it into a conflictual issue, but rather say, here's what I've been learning, here's what I think you need to know, here's what I think this means that we're going to need to do. On the other hand, and I think you're seeing this especially at the national level, you can turn this into a partisan conflict in and of itself, where the experts are on one side and the people are on the other. And that's where you're gonna have a real clash and that's where you're gonna really have problems. And, and part of that has involved what I think is an unrealistic kind of dichotomy between economics and public health. Because without, without taking care of the virus, there will be no economic activity. You could open up whatever you want, but 
people are not going to feel safe going out. And so you're not really going to make any kind of progress. I mean, most economists you listen to talk about the need to first take care of the virus and then you can move into into more of these uh, in, into these sort of economic questions. That's right. And, and but for for people to be able to feel secure in that, they need to feel that they can feed their families and have a safe place to be, et cetera. I, I want to um, bring things back to Taylor. I know that last week we we talked Taylor, uh, and I asked you about some success stories. You know, because I see what you're doing uh, with with the 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 policy to. Uh, the, excuse me, the research policy collaboration that you're a part of. Um, you've had some successes in the past in, in, in bringing data to uh, legislators that helped you, you know, fund um, more prevention of, of child abuse, et cetera. Could you speak to that a little bit and tell us it's like a, like a happy, <laughs> a happy moment that, that where, where policymaking and research did come together? Sure. I also want to just piggyback on, I guess, where, where we've taken the narrative already is about this kind of um, elitism and how it becomes this tension between the people versus the elites. I, I do feel like in a lot of my work, I try to carry through this idea of um, outreach of the academic community, because I, I do think that um, what's exacerbating this dichotomy right now is a lack of um, a lack of trusting relationships between community partners, people who represent the people, and um, and the people who are studying the people. So if we are kind of in our ivory tower separate from the people, how can they trust the ivory tower? And so um, I think that our academies are really starting to recognize the need for scholarly engagement and so we're really part of that effort as well. And this is both a systemic effort, a systemic need within our institutions to reinforce those um, engagement efforts, as well as providing mechanisms for doing so. And that's what we are. We are a mechanism for scholarly engagement in the policy space, particularly. Um, in terms of successes, um, carrying that that relational aspect through, we can look at something that we've done in the policy space to to work with policymakers on the prevention science of child abuse. And that is that we know that there's a lot of promise in preventing child abuse before it occurs. And that has the potential to be really cost effective because if you don't prevent child abuse, you can expect a lot of downstream consequences from that trauma to occur for, for the victims and the families and the system as well, including the cost of foster care, as well as the cost of um, me mental and behavioral challenges for the kids who may not do as well in school as a consequence of lifelong con uh, consequence of trauma. So why don't we just prevent it in the first place? <laughs> but we need to be able to effectively communicate that science. And so what we did working with the Child Maltreatment Solutions Network is that we um, formed some relationships with particularly the leaders in Congress on child maltreatment initiatives. That includes caucus leaders and committee leader staff. Uh, for example, um, Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee in the Senate is one that is charged with the reauthorization of the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. Um, so working in coordination with those legislative partners, we, uh, we knew and anticipated that they were looking to reauthorize that big piece of child welfare legislation that does have a prevention component. And we organized a congressional briefing at the end of 2018, just before the new Congress started. It was in that lame duck period, and they were starting to put pen to paper on how they wanted to reauthorize that legislation. And so it was great timing for us, and we could only navigate that timing in partnership with the legislative offices. So once we planned that briefing, we, um, I believe that the folks at the um, Child Maltreatment Solutions Network became uh, recognized as leaders, uh, scholarly leaders in that space. And as a consequence, we were asked to um, provide testimony, in, which is a 
a lot more formal of an activity compared to congressional briefing. That's something that um, external organizations outside of Congress can plan and produce like a panel for policy audiences. In comparison, the testimony is something that um, is a hearing that is organized by a committee, for example, a formal entity within Congress. It becomes a part of uh, official congressional record. And they generally only go to the folks who they trust to sort of stay, um, to, to not sink the ship of whatever legislative effort they're going to do. And they want to make sure it's a, a super credible entity um, that, that they can count on to, to do quality work for that testimonial speak. So they came to us about that, which was really exciting. We had two weeks to prepare written testimony, prepare oral testimony, which is about three minutes, and prepare for questions, and then tr have someone travel to give that. Um, two weeks turnaround for something that's official record seems like really shocking to most people in the academy. So we help to uh, we have to navigate that policy experience. And we came at it as a team effort of folks from the center who were all working together um, to shape that narrative very quickly and have that person travel and represent the work. Um, of course, there's a lot of voices in any policy effort, so it's hard to point a finger to say like exactly what the win is for any one particular effort. But we can say that um, the, the House in particular aimed in past a uh, legislative effort that increased prevention funding significantly. Well done. You know, I love the fact that you talked about the collaborative side of that. We're, we're always about collaboration on this podcast. And also you talked about time, the accelerated timeline of two weeks. And that reminds me of something Jen, Jenna brought up to me yesterday that we really need to touch on in this conversation about the real time uh, aspect of what's going on with, with COVID-19. Jenna, do you wanna hit us with that question? Uh, yeah, sure. I do have uh, one other um, follow up though, but before we get to that, um, so Taylor, as, as you were just describing, there's all this work that happens. It, it seems like on a, on a bipartisan basis. And I, I'm reminded of an interview that we did on our show with a political scientist named Frances Lee, who's at Princeton. And one of the things she talked about was how in how the, the, the media and the public kind of perceives Congress. It's very much about the partisan confrontations and, and all of those sorts of things. And these more bipartisan efforts tend not to get the media spotlight. And, you know, one, because it's not as lucrative for the media's profit models, but also there's some incentive on behalf of the lawmakers themselves that you know, if they can amp up that they're fighting for their side, that's going to help rally voters for the next election. And so I'm wondering what what your experience in in this realm has been. I mean, are the, the people you work with, are these efforts getting attention or are they more behind the scenes or, or how do the folks you work with navigate this tension between their their policy objectives and maybe their their partisan allegiances that they feel like they have to project? Okay, so I think I think that you're hinting at something that I categorize as like this tension between inside and outside approaches, where um, this concept came from Ken Matten at UMBC. He's a, a another community psychologist that I, I work with and um, bat around ideas. He published a book about how psychologists engage in policy process, and I love this dimension, this this characterization because. There's a lot of different ways to go about policy engagement, and they can be um, symbiotic or they can be synergistic, uh, where on, on one side of the coin, you have people who can um, really sort of rally and say, this is not right. You need to be, policymakers need to be doing something different. And then on the other side of the coin, there's people who work with policymakers on existing policy priorities and goals. Um, I think that the, the trust in, in those relationships on the inside approach to sort of providing more technical assistance and consultation is something that you have to be very careful about because your allegiances on the outside approaches can potentially undermine your credibility as a, a trusted consultant. 
but in the grand scheme of things, you might expect those two efforts to, those two types of efforts to really work in synchrony because on the outside of Congress, you have um, efforts to really mobilize public support, which is, um, for lack of a better word, a bit of a more coercive technique to convince policymakers to do something different that they're not doing already. Um, That's very important, especially whenever there's not already the demonstrated public will. Uh, That's policymakers' real goal is to serve people, right? They're elected to serve and represent the beliefs of the people. And if the beliefs of the people aren't um, consistent with the science, then that's probably where you need to go to shape the agenda, the political agenda. Working within the political agenda, we can help to respond to the existing needs or interests and potentially do a bit of a subtler navigation of those um, interests, but it's um, much more, uh, it's much a le- less political uh, behind the scenes, I would say. And so, so I think what Taylor is describing about their work at the committee level is exactly where you would expect expertise to have the most influence and the most impact on policymaking, because Here's a level that's sort of below public perception. It's uh, it, it's lower visibility, and more importantly, you're talking about ongoing relationships that allow legislators to develop and, and their staffs to develop uh, some element of trust with the pe- with the uh, experts that they're talking to, or their representatives, or however this is is being communicated. And then that can work its way into policy making through their discussions, through the committee hearings, as Taylor was talking about. And this all tends to take place at a level that I think is sort of below public uh, public attention and below the sort of partisan conflicts that happen when things are raised up to say the leadership level or to the to the party level. Now, where I think we start to run into some problems, and why I think the initiative that's being described today is so important is that in many ways, committee work has been increasingly devalued within Congress. And I think that's some of what Francis Lee is getting at that you were referring to before. Uh, Parties in Congress are becoming more ideologically coherent uh, and conflict within Congress has also become much more competitive uh, in in terms of who's gonna control both the House and the Senate. And this means that at a certain level, the, the, the conflict between parties is more intense than ever before, because uh, it doesn't take much to switch the chambers from one party to the other. Uh, it also means that things tend to get elevated up to the leadership level. Uh, here's some other examples of this. For example, uh, members of Congress are hiring fewer staff within con- within Washington. They're putting more of it out in their districts. District staff take care of constituency issues, but they don't really take care of the hard work of policy making. Uh, There are fewer committee hearings than there used to be. Uh, Work is increasingly taken out of the hands of committees and put into these sort of omnibus bills, which are pulling together work, pulling together issues from a variety of committees and uh, into uh, into the uh, leadership committees or other kinds of uh, other kinds of uh, leadership uh, tools. Uh, You know, the committee system in Congress was developed in large part to develop expertise. And so the idea here was that you can let people work over a long period of time. This is why seniority was important. They get to know an area. They get to know the experts within that area. Uh, So the committee work is very important and and efforts to sort of undermine committees. For example, term limits undermine that element of committees because it means that you're taking people out just as they're really starting to learn what it is that they're talking about and when they're really starting to learn who the experts are in the area that they need to talk with. So I think the kind of thing Taylor describes is, you know, fighting against some important trends in Congress uh, as a way of getting uh, getting uh, important scientific information into the hands of legislators. I think sure. you're right that the politicized polarization of Congress is more challenging and problematic than um, most people have experienced in their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also want to add maybe a brief of fresh air, breath of fresh air that um, behind the scenes, things look a little bit more functional than what we see in the media. Um, Even I can point to some examples where bipartisanship seems to be working fairly okay. For example, um, staff in Ways and Means of the, one of the most um, re- reputable 
uh, committees in the House because they control entitlement funding and taxes. It's a longstanding committee. They say that their bipartisan process has been working pretty well because they they work well together. That's not the case in all committees, of course, and it may not be the case in all subcommittees, subtopic issues that are really, you know, where the fever pitch and polarization is occurring. But um, I think that on the outside of things, things look a lot more dramatic than what you see when you're behind the scenes. Yeah, I think that's I think that's uh, that's that's very true. And committees are quite different, you know. And 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 some, as you describe, like I think Ways and Means, sort of an elite committee, uh, much less partisan sort of committee. Others are really designed by their leaders in terms of who they put on them for them to represent the sort of partisan conflicts that are going on at the, you know, at the level of elite partisan competition. And so, for example, the judiciary committees are highly partisan. Uh, and, and I could point to others, two committees that are dealing with issues around climate change. It's much more difficult, I think, to get uh, science in in a bipartisan sort of way on those committees than it might be on some of the one on some of the others. Like, for example, the what you were talking about with uh, with child abuse issues. And and so the other thing that's kind of complicating all of this, um, bringing it back around to COVID nineteen, is that the the policy and the legislating essentially is happening at the same time. I think that that's what you were were getting at, Cole. So, um, it, you know, how are how are legislators navigating some of these challenges, or maybe not? <laughs> how is that playing out, both from a from a policy perspective and from a, a political one? Yeah, well, when I think when you're in a crisis sort of situation like this, policy making power passes more to the executive than in, in the legislature. And so mostly what you're seeing going on within the legislature right now are these sort of economic responses to what's going on and not a whole lot about decision making around when we should reopen, how we should be addressing this. That's all being dealt with within the administ- within the executive branch and, of course, the state governments. Uh drawing on already passed legislation that empowers, you know, the CDC and the NIH and these other agencies to take certain kinds of actions or to play certain sort sorts of advisory roles. And I, and I think you're seeing real differences across the states and across the countries in how expertise is used to make these sort of decisions. You know, you look at, you look at countries like New Zealand and Australia, one led by a conservative government, one led by a liberal government, but in both cases, uh, you know, experts, uh, public health officials really took the lead in making decisions about what was going to be done. And they have similar sort of responses and effective responses as well, because everything was sort of moved below the ideological level and their expert, experts were allowed to have a large say. I think you saw this in Seattle, actually, in the United States. And uh, but you can you, you can sort of see this conflict between between the public and the experts play themselves out in different kinds of states where states with more conservative populations, more populous populations, where there's much more resistance to expertise are under pressure to open much sooner. And I think that's why they're opening sooner. They're 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 responding to the pressure that they're getting from their constituents. I, I definitely agree. There's a lot of impetus for the executive branch in the COVID crisis, but Congress has also been busier than ever. Like it's unheard of to see this much legislative activity going on right now. I just pulled up my dashboard and it yeah, looks like in very little time too. Very little time. Yeah. In the last three months, they've introduced 322 bills related to COVID-19, where the fever pitch looked like it happened around March 22nd. The activity has sort of stabilized since then, but I remember just anecdotally looking at my dashboard one day and seeing at least 30 bills introduced on one day, and I was just astonished because usually yeah. in this term of the legislative session, they're not introducing as many bills. They're looking to just sort of ride the wave of the stuff they already did in the first half of the term and you know get things passed so that they can look good for elections. Yeah, I had no doubt that COVID has... Uh completely realigned the agenda within Congress, uh, you know, and they're working pretty feverishly, especially when you consider how rarely they're actually in session these days, especially the House, uh, which has been in session less than the Senate has, and the Senate's in session mostly in order to do judicial nominees, not really to work on COVID-related issues. But there, there are a whole variety of issues that COVID raises that they're legislating on. But, but you know, the immediate decisions, do we close this border or not? Do we... Uh, 
you know, are we making are, are the are the guidelines from the CDC going to set this kind of requirement for opening up or this kind well suggestion not requirement for opening up or this kind of suggestion all that's coming out of the executive branch under pre-existing authorizations uh past you know at a past at other times and there's also i mean and, and this is something that kind of concerns me about what's going on in congress right now there's no oversight of congr- of executive actions going on and this is a big part of what Congress is supposed to be doing. Uh, you know, part of it is the kind of stonewalling we've often seen from the administration in terms of allowing the House in particular to exercise oversight, but they also just haven't really quite figured out this issue of how do we have hearings, for example, uh, remotely. And it can be done, but you know, there's nothing more, there's, there, there's nothing more traditionally oriented than Congress, so it's very hard to get them to move to new ways of doing things. Even the Supreme Court moved more to was able to move to uh, to a virtual meeting more than uh, the Congress has been able to. The Huck Institutes of the Life Sciences at Penn State offers six intercollege graduate degree programs in bioinformatics and genomics, ecology, integrative and biomedical physiology molecular, cellular, and integrative biosciences, neuroscience, and plant biology. We also offer an accelerated professional science master's program in biotechnology. At the Huck, we immerse students in a groundbreaking environment built on interdisciplinary collaboration among some of the world's most innovative research scientists, and our students receive unparalleled access to bleeding-edge technology in world-class core facilities. If you're looking for a deeper, more holistic grad school experience, you owe it to yourself to look at the Huck. Visit us online today at huck.psu.edu. I'd like to circle back around to something that Taylor shared earlier about uh, the research to policy collaboration and the fact that you've you've made these connections. You've you've done the matchmaking, um, particularly around child abuse prevention was was one of those areas, uh, and and about prevention of of things we don't want to happen. Uh, you've gotten quite good at that. So I'm wondering, um, how do you shift to this new COVID world where everything is happening hyper fast? It's, it's stakes so high in so many dimensions, economic health, et cetera, et cetera. Are there people you're focusing on, new, new folks that you want to reach uh, to add into your sort of Rolodex of, of different political offices that, that you're focusing on in terms of COVID? And then on the other side, are there particular researchers that you're trying to match up with those different offices? Certainly. I, I can't remember our exact numbers, but I think that since all of this started, we've probably identified another 60 to 70, maybe more researchers who are eager to get involved in translating research as it relates to COVID-19. Very exciting to see um, people who are so passionate about these issues really um, ready to invest their time, especially when there's not um, structures and re- structural reinforcement from our academic institutions on average to help um, sustain academic scholarly engagement. This is really an, an intrinsic reward system that we're operating on that people want their research to matter. They want to make a difference in the world. Um, on the congressional side, certainly there are different strategic priorities of, uh, of how you reach out to someone depending on the kind of area of impact you're looking to to have. And so, for example, in um, the work that the Huck Center is doing, one of the things that we would hope to do is to reach out to um, legislators who represent other universities, because the Huck Center um, is hoping to do a study that would look at um, the the serology and the immunity that comes from, um, from the crisis from having um, been exposed to the virus, if that's a protective factor for in, uh, for communities to uh, have people who have already got that immunity, it how can we examine whether or not? Um, sorry, I'm not doing this topic justice, but my my point here is that when um, when you have a congressional when you have a a particular effort where you know that 
key, key targets include those with jurisdiction or those who are champions of particular issues. In this case, it would be of land-grant universities that are key to studying the, the serology or the transmission of um, virus and the immunity process then we need to work with those partners who have the potential to make a difference in that area. And so it shifts our priorities in terms of how we outreach with those congressional the leadership in those topic areas. And, and are, is, the, is there a committee put together? Has there been a committee put together at the congressional level that's just focusing on COVID-19? Um, I actually don't know that right now. I don't know that right now. Either. I thought I thought actually that the House had formed a committee that in part was going to have oversight over COVID-19, in particular, the enormous sums of money that are going out the door. for, for They COVID. need an oversight committee to yes. make sure that there's um, accountability of how those government dollars. Yeah. Are oh, absolutely. And there's been there's been resistance to it. It's become very politicized. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where it stands, but it is within, you know, the power of the majority to basically do what they want on mm -hmm. these things. So and so I expect mm -hmm. that they form a committee like that. And then, you know, the minority has the choice of putting members on that committee or not, but I, I certainly expect that we'll see something like that. The Senate may be less likely, but the House is much more reliant on committees than the Senate is. It's a larger institution, it's organized differently, makes more use of committees than the Senate tends to do, tends to do anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. So looking at this, it says that the Oversight Committee will be looking to provide oversight on the nation's preparedness in response to the outbreak. Yeah, so that's the that's the standing oversight committee, not a right, not, not, not a new committee, right? But I, because there is a standing oversight committee, uh, and you know, I'm sure even though Congress is not in session, that their staff they're working remotely like everybody else, and I, I'm sure they're doing quite a bit of this oversight as we're as we're speaking. But I I do believe they're going to form a separate committee to overlook. Uh, I'm sorry to oversee. Uh, some of this money that's been uh, going out the door. Uh, so I know we only have a, a few minutes left, but I wanted to to come back to something that uh, is really at the the heart of democracy, and I think also at the the heart of a lot of this this policy work we've been talking about, and that is um, where people get their information or kind of the the sources that they they value for information. Um, there's there's increasingly, I think, a, a divide where. Uh, people, you know, largely on the, the right tend to be more more apt to, you know, conspiracy theories or sources of information that are not grounded in in policy or in expertise or all these these things we've been talking about. And so the the very cynical question that's been going through the back of my mind through this whole discussion as we've been prepping is so that there's all this work being done. But, you know, what is the impact if if the public doesn't believe it or some segment of the public doesn't believe it or doesn't buy it or is is prone to believe something that it's not entirely based in evidence? And I'm just wondering, like, how can these like is is the the best case scenario that these two things just continue to exist in separate worlds where the the people who are on board with policy and expertise are kind of on one side and then people that have have a different set of beliefs are on another or where do we where do we go from here you know i hear taylor describing two things uh if i'm not misrepresenting this taylor one is that you're focusing on the committee level and working with members and staff uh, in the policy making process. And then there's also this need for scientists and academics to get their research out into the public in a way that they can understand it. And I know that's something that's discussed quite a bit within the social sciences these days and, and, and how to do that. You know, the, the issue on the second in particular is really this notion that there's almost a epistemological polarization going on in this country right now at the mass level, uh, where, you know, you have people divided along partisan, almost tribal lines, uh, where they're within their own media sources, and in many cases, media silos. And in one of them in particular, you know, conspiracy theories abound. Uh, there is a sort of populist distrust of expertise. Uh, and it is very difficult to get through, to get through that. 
Uh, I don't have a simple answer for, for how that would be done. And I think actually that what you're often seeing uh, from national politicians plays directly into this by just sort of confusing things. You know, I mean, we, we need it, it. It's up to political leaders, I think, to communicate the science, the expertise, what needs to be done in ways that the public can understand. Uh, and part of what this means is to not contradict them when you're standing next to them, uh, to not confuse things by just throwing out a whole range of facts, some of which are true and some of which are just pulled out of thin air. Uh, it, it means not creating a sort of chaotic environment uh, where you don't know what's true and what's what's not. And, and I think that is what we're seeing more and more, uh, especially within the right, I think. Uh, and this is this is very challenging when you get into an issue that deals with, you know, such complex scientific information. Now, it's not inevitable that things go this way. I look at some states uh, led by Democratic governors and led by Republican governors, uh, where the governors have very high approval from the public and they're taking very strong action, you know, relatively speaking, not compared to what, what, what happened in Asia, but, but very strong measures within their states for social distancing and the like. Public supports them and understands what's going on. There's a sort of coherent message that's coming out. The national level, I think you're seeing something very different. Uh, from my point of view, I'm just as happy to see the task force go because I think that it was confusing matters. I think they were standing up there as a sort of foil to the president for him to argue with and for him to contradict and in a way to play into this kind of very confused sort of information ecosystem, ecosystem that's really, uh, really quite dangerous. I think that what you said about contradicting um, decision makers is really important, especially in the work that I do is, you know, so relational focus, but also we're trying to draw on communication sciences as well. And one of the things that we have recognized is that it's bad practice to reiterate a mistruth. Instead, best practice is to just say the truth and stick to the truth. That is something that doesn't have to directly contradict a decision maker and say, you lie, ruining that relationship and, and putting, pitting yourself at odds politically with whoever backs that person because they're going to trust their political leader and that ideology. Instead, just saying, well, I, well, the truth is this thing. You're following communication by science as well as, um, as, well as not putting yourself in jeopardy of politicizing um, you, you against the politician. Yep. Um, but the other thing that I want to also recognize is that um, in order for scientists to have better relationships with um, communities, with people, with um, organizations, politicians, we also need to recognize that there are multiple forms of expertise that policymakers and decision makers rely on, including um, decision making uh, relies on lived experiences of their constituents, as well as the folks who are policy experts. And admittedly, a lot of scientists don't have a lot of policy training. Um, so how are we supposed to predict what the unintended consequences are of taking action on our narrow slice of expertise? And so I think it's helpful to build relationships when we recognize these multiple forms of expertise because it allows us to develop partnerships um, that would help to well balance out the, the narrow slice of um, scientific knowledge that we have and thinking about how that can actually be used and what the um, meaning behind that would be for people at different levels in our communities and at the local level, state level, different levels of governance, uh, different types of organizations. Yeah, I, I, I think you need both the experts and the politicians working together. And I mean, there is something that a politician brings to this that, a, you know, a, a scientist or, you know, a public health official does not necessarily bring to it. They, an understanding of their constituents, an understanding of how to communicate with them. Uh, an understanding of what will fly and what won't, uh, an understanding of how to lay the groundwork uh, for certain kinds of changes that may be coming for people's lives. I mean, so it's important that they be able to, to work together. 
Uh, what concerns me about the sort of epistemological polarization that I was mentioning is that it almost seems sometimes in this country like uh, people are seeing two entirely different realities or working from different sets of facts or understandings of what's happening in the world and, and, uh, and where they're getting their information from. And democracy needs some kind of a common basis in what's actually happening in the world in order to be able to, to come up with solutions to it. Now, I mean, the truth will always be contested. People will always bring in their, their sort of uh, the, the facts and the information that helps to advance their point of view. So, so to a certain extent, information is always partisan in that it's being brought in to advance one argument or another. But we're at a kind of different point where there's not even common agreement on what we're seeing in, in front of ourselves. And, uh, you know, that's been developing for many years. It's a complex topic. Uh, so let me just leave it at, I'll just leave it at that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Michael and Taylor. Um, we're going to be running out of time here pretty soon. So I'm, I'm going to try and reflect back some things that I just heard as we wrap this up. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation uh, to bring together two worlds of, of, politics and, and research, as we're always trying to do on the podcast, is bring in different voices from different places. So I just want to uh, wrap up here by saying, you know, Taylor, I heard what you said. It's, it's best policy and communication to stick to just the facts, ma'am. And, and Michael, what you're saying is not everybody agrees on those facts. Yep. And so this idea of trust and who do we believe and what are the facts and also the lived experience that Taylor brought up, I think, is really important. Um, you know, here, right here in Center County, Penn State is about to launch um, a local effort. It's called the Data for Action Plan for Center County, where we, we listen to the voices of the different people and we hear what they're going through with COVID on the economic side, on the health side, on the belief side. And we're trying to put this into practice, like real time, gather the data and help uh, local officials to, to make better informed decisions for the safety of Center County residents uh, and also doing the soro serology testing of, of the potential immunity to COVID that Taylor spoke of earlier. So we are, we are in the middle of this right now. And, and a, a big thing going on in those conversations is the voices, the voices of all those different people that need to be heard and what do they believe and where are they getting their information. And we really have to address these things. We really have to address them and unpack them and hear the voices and make the connections the way that Taylor's doing with her group is that, that connective, the collaborative, so that the voices can be heard so that we can have the best picture possible to make the best decisions possible and, and continue to evolve our processes so that um, those processes do serve everybody more and more and more. That's, that's at least my hope. That's what, you know, we're trying to contribute to that right here with this podcast by bringing different voices on to, to be heard and share ideas uh, with this idea that we, we can get better at it. We can evolve this and, and democracy is a, is a good way to do that. And we should preserve democracy so that these voices can be heard so that we don't fall into some sort of fascist situation uh, where, where people are just dominated uh, beyond belief. Um, we're trying to, you know, evolve, evolve past that as well and find creative solutions where it's not a question of your life or your livelihood, you know? So, so I want to thank all of you for being on the podcast today. Uh, I think you're all doing great work that helps to evolve our culture and helps to preserve democracy and helps to make connections of people that maybe wouldn't get connected. And that we're doing all this stuff in service to, to the evolution of, of our society towards a, a healthier, happier, a more prosperous one. And it's certainly a really difficult uh, time for everybody right now. But I would say that, um, doing this kind of work is is that much more important so i want to thank all of you for the work you're doing i want to thank you for being on the podcast today and um to our listeners out there uh, thanks for listening in and uh, don't stop co-evolving thanks a lot